Thank you very much. I'm very cute of time and I'm also very cute of the uh, previous speakers and I certainly don't have that sort of gravity. But anyway, I'd like uh, to start out by paying tribute to the traditional owners of the, Yong the Yongu people and the five regional clan groups, the Gumach, the Rujingu, Yapu, Galpu and Wanguri. And I acknowledge and pay respects to the elders past and present. I'd also like to extend my thanks to the Yothi Yundi Foundation and organisations in providing this opportunity to address this important gathering. My name is Eddie Fry and I am a Dogerman man from the Catherine region in the Northern Territory, but I've not grown up on country and I'm not in line uh, for any of those responsibilities. And that's fine. I was born into a family of 10 and my mum and dad took in other people to our extended family. Such was, such was the world that I grew up in, where the only way I could describe the families of those times was when parents had hearts the size of 44 gallon drums. I wasn't born into wealth. My parents instilled into me and my siblings that if you wanted something, you had to work for it. So I'm no different to anyone here today. I was taught to respect my elders, so I'd like to start my presentation today with this important quote from one of them. Yalori Yunipingu, a member of the Gumach clan of the Yongu people and a pioneer, as you know, of indigenous land rights, said it is through the song cycles that we acknowledge our allegiance to land, to our laws, to our life, to our ancestors and to each other, and that we travel these song cycles as a guide to life and the essence of our people keeping it all in balance so that wealth and prosperity might flow, so that wealth and prosperity might flow from a balanced setting. Listening uh, to the previous speakers, and one of them obviously being uh, Mr Unipingu, I've taken it to mean he wants the land woken up. Listening also to the other um, speakers in um, Noel Pearson about the renaissance around economic uh, development is, is an absolute must going forward, and also from uh, Mr Patrick Dodson's and also members of the reconciliation panel. Turning to the Indigenous estate. It was in early 2015 that I was watching TV on a Sunday and purely by chance called an Indigenous person, which was Mick Gooder, on TV, on the drum, talking about the Indigenous estate. I hadn't heard of this, the Indigenous estate. What was this really all about? I had not long been appointed to the chair of IBA. Was there another commercial vehicle that no one cared to mention to me, as is, is the want in Indigenous affairs. What followed was a mission to discover and determine what is the oft quoted as the Indigenous estate. To find out, I set myself four questions. First of all, how is the Indigenous estate defined? What is its known definition? What comprises the Indigenous estate? In other words, what is, what is the composition of the Indigenous estate and its asset list? What is the current state of play? In other words, how is it operating? Which led to the fourth question, and that is, what are the structural settings of the Indigenous estate? Were they fragmented? Were they coupled together? Uh, was it an integrated structure? Here's what I've found so far. In relation to the first question, the definition of the Indigenous estate, the Indigenous estate comprises the assets held, or reasonably likely to be held, by or for the benefit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, whether by traditional owners, native title and state territory land rights based organisations. Additionally, federal, state and territory organisations, state bodies and funds established to act in the interest of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including without limitation, the assets with IBA and the ILC, the Indigenous land account, Aboriginal benefits account and anomalous structures under state and territory regimes. Commercial or not-for-profit organisations established by or for the benefit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That's the mix. The second question as it relates to what comprises the assets of the Indigenous estate. To my horror, no one's actually mapped this out to the extent that I thought it would have been done by now. However, the discovery so far is that there are tangible assets being lands and waters and the resources located on 
or with them. Fixed property, that is the built environment, and intangible assets being Indigenous culture and intellectual property rights as they exist in forms of expressions, arts, music, language. Traditional culture, environmental and bioscience practices, and other forms of traditional knowledge. I would also argue that these intangible assets are also include the inherent potential within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to bring new perspectives, knowledge and innovation to the wider economy. In relation to the third question, what is the current state of play of the Indigenous estate? We know that the land rights in the Northern Territory started back in 1976 or 75. We also know that in South Australia that, uh, uh, that pretty much came about in 75. But I want to use my starting point as 22 years on from the introduction of the Native Title Act and capture the other two uh, that I've just mentioned. I believe the Indigenous estate stands at an inflection point. Over the past decade in particular, we witnessed an accelerated period of agreement making in the context of determinations and under the Future Acts regime, as well as under applicable state and territory-based legislation. Clearly, much of this benefit has flowed from resources-related activity. Studies conducted on behalf of IBA to date estimate that there could be up to 10 to 15 billion in investable assets comprised in the Indigenous estate, much of which is held in trust. Now, 10 to 15 billion, you might think, well, that's a quite a lot of money, but when you consider it in the context of the Australian GDP, which is currently running around 1.4 trillion, it's not a lot. By and large, these funds are derived from an asset swap or conversion of interest in which Indigenous communities exchange their inherent rights in or to their assets, lands, waters, related rights and or intellectual property for financial assets, primarily cash or rights to participate in the relevant projects through contracting and employment. While the total funds flowing from such determinations and agreement making has been large, the number of new determination agreements per annum seems to be slow. This is primarily because we're in, we are entering a period of transition from the capital expenditure phase of the resource boom into the operational phase with investment in new projects <coughs> slowing down. The commercial viability and operating model of many resource projects has also been challenged by continued downward pressure on commodity prices, particularly in the bulk commodity areas of iron ore and coal. This in turn has resulted in a reduction in, and in some cases, a cessation of the level of royalties flowing into the Indigenous estate as projects are downsized or ceased altogether. While there remains a reasonably long tail of operational activity left to run, particularly from large resource players who can withstand commodity price volatility, volatility and also the money market volatility, in addition to that, what we call a high volume turnover in, in stock, um, which seems to go on endlessly, and the royalties and other payments that can flow from such activity into the Indigenous state are inevitably finite. In other words, they will come to an end. As a result, in many cases, Indigenous communities and their leaders are nego negotiating a conversion of their interest in circumstances where they have a single, once-in-a-generation opportunity to gain an economic foothold. In addition, they must establish and manage the competing and often urgent short, medium and long-term needs and aspirations of each of their community to maximise the financial opportunity and create social, cultural and economic returns. The result of this is that in absence of any other actions, the quantum of new funds flowing into the estate may and is highly likely to decline over the medium term. The funds accumulated to date need to be prudently invested and managed so that they can sustain communities who can stand to benefit over the long term and well beyond the current resources boom. The non-financial assets within the estate, particularly lands and waters, need to be identified and assessed strategically for their commercial potential so that they can be put to their highest and best use. Ultimately, for the benefit of the constituent communities, this requires long-term planning and structural design. The commercial potential of Indigenous cultural and intellectual property, which is unique in a global setting, is not well understood. Supported or integrated into the economic analysis of the development potential of the Indigenous opportunities 
We need innovative approaches and thinking to develop ventures through which the Indigenous estate can be leveraged into future waves of business activity. This, why I say we're at a, this is why I say we're at an inflection point. Because if we act to put the Indigenous estate on a sound footing, a sound structural footing, such that it is well understood and managed to its maximum potential, we can grow the estate substantially and potentially exponentially for the benefit of its constituent communities. Conversely, if appropriate structures are not put in place, there is a real risk that communities could or will lose their once in a generation opportunity to gain an economic foothold. And in some cases, this can and will occur quite rapidly as the drawdown of available funds will occur. And in relation to the last question, what, it, what is the Indigenous state existing and operating on? That is, what are its structural settings? I believe that the estate as a whole is not well understood, nor is it managed to the maximum potential. My observations are, federal, state and territory policies relating to economic development are fragmented and often misaligned with each other. Through inadequate planning and coordination and through what we call creep, in organisational strategy and a lack of clarity about our roles, a number of government, indigenous, private and not-for-profit organisations have overlapping mandates and conflicting approaches. The result is, is that economic development within the estate, the efforts are not coordinated and do not utilise human, human resources and funding efficiently. There does appear, or there does not appear to have been a coordinated strategy or strategic review of the lands and waters held across the Indigenous estate to, to identify the highest and best use of each parcel. In other words, we are operating in absence of a very detailed strategic mapping. That is a cadastral mapping exercise particularly around lands. As a result, much of the Indigenous estate remains unutilised or underutilised and is looked over in favour of non-Indigenous land held by others. Further, this lack of planning has meant that there has been an underinvestment by governments in the infrastructure needed to make such land investment ready. And many of you here today would know about the booming agribusiness that's on our now, now on our doorstep. We are well behind the eight ball. There has not been sufficient thought or support given to initiatives that can provide a proper commercial platform for our intellectual property and knowledge, such as forms of expression in arts and music, or the employment of Indigenous knowledge in environmental management and bio-life sciences. Governments seem to struggle, or maybe they don't understand the actual or potential savings that could accrue from better structural planning, utilisation and management of the Indigenous estate nor do we have sound, widely accepted measures of these benefits. In turn, this precludes the appropriate application of funds, for example, for feasibility assessments that can kickstart or support initiatives to harness the potential of the estate. There is a lack of capacity among many Indigenous organisations to participate effectively in commercial ventures and decision making. Additionally, organisations often lack access to the economies of scale and shared services or other efficiencies that they need to pursue commercial opportunities properly. Many Indigenous organisations lack access to sound investment or commercial advice from advisors with strong expertise and ethics. Where funds have been accumulated, they have often not had the benefit of a prudent underlying investment strategy and management approaches. In some cases, this has been precluded by restrictions imposed by statute, regulation or by external players, e.g., for example, providers of royalties, with the result that funds have been left sitting in cash over several investment cycles. A clear case in point is the land account, a large quantum of funds which has been invested in cash or cash equivalent instruments over a period of 20 years, during which there has been considerable growth in the equity markets. Some analysts suggest that cash rates underperform, could underperform inflation over relatively long periods in the coming cycle, meaning that in real terms, the purchasing power of the funds will go backwards. 
I find that just staggering, to be honest. The narrative of what I might call wicked problems now used by some in, in government departments can make the solution appear further out of reach than they really are. While the landscape is complex, I believe the solutions are often inhibited by a lack of coordination and strategic foresight, rather than insurmountable obstacles. A holistic approach across governments, agencies and other players or actors would ensure that the assets within the Indigenous estate, whether they're current or future, are properly identified. Resources are shared where possible and put to the best use. Organisations and their constituent communities can be properly informed about how to make prudent decisions regarding their economic aspirations in relation to their assets. Funds flowing from such assets, whether through a conversion of interest or otherwise, are properly invested and managed for the benefit of current and future generations. And I want to hold that point about the future generations because I'll tap into that at the end about future proofing. As a result, across Northern Australia in particular, Indigenous groups have vast land holdings. However, at the end of the day, Indigenous people do not have the wealth or influence that ownership of such a vast estate should bring. Poor health, education and stubbornly low living standards have left us ill-equipped to compete for development or to leverage benefits from our assets. Too few past investments have delivered intergenerational wealth or intergenerational transfer. The economic well-being that underpins other forms of well-being, which is the main underpinning platform for the non-Indigenous population of Australia. We must identify and maximise the economic value of our current land and other asset holdings. We need to create new pathways and journeys about our land, about our assets, our relationship and our obligations. We must preserve our land's social and cultural values, ensure our future well-being, st strengthen our unique identity and take our rightful place within our great land. Our gift to the future, our forward consignment, is to set in train the building blocks for prosperity. What has been called the Indigenous estate has re-emerged in the form of land and property holdings and significant cash-based deposits. According to estimates, Indigenous people now own or have controlling interest to some 40% of the Australian landmass under various forms of title and legislation. And on the face of it, that's a pretty extensive area. However, it has not brought us much influence on the national stage or converted benefits for Indigenous people of a proportionate amount. We own a great deal of land that is currently not productive in main terms. Yet we might have a 10 or $15 billion value to it, but in terms of its yield in, into the GDP of 1.3 to 1.4 trillion, it is very definitely not productive. Where to now? I believe we're at a watershed, a watershed in Indigenous affairs. Our population is growing much faster than the general population at 2.3% per annum and it is overwhelmingly a younger population. Put simply, our vast land holdings and interests that must sustain a growing population are not helped by outdated management and poor execution. We Indigenous Australians stand at an inflection point. Our future relies not on chance, but on creating a new fellowship among Indigenous people and their organisations, government, corporate Australia, domestic and foreign investors. Unlocking the economic potential of the estate without compromising our cultural values can be achieved. The Indigenous estate is a central concept, one that we as people need to get to grips with. We need to define this concept, understand what it is made up of and maximise its potential. We need to own it and make it great so that it becomes synonymous with success and the highest standards. So that it becomes a brand for the Indigenous estate that encompasses land, culture, people and opportunity that will allow us to forge our way forward in the Australian economy. We must learn and apply various techniques and capabilities to harness the wider Australian economy to our benefit. This will be necessarily a long-term project encompassing many decades. 
We need a target and a plan to withstand the tests and changes of time. If we don't think in these terms, we are likely to be captured by the short term. A lot of things, as I've come to learn in the last 20 months, that I've been associated with IBAN in the last seven months with ILC, a lot of things in Indigenous Affairs generally seem to be operating in the short term. There is too little strategic or structural design or structural thinking. There is, there is a lack of very critical thinking to the whole footprint. We need a 50-year vision. You might say a 50-year vision. Well, since, two, since 1770, that's 246 years. This is only one-fifth of that time frame. I see the Indigenous estate lifted beyond current perception of what is possible in the Indigenous estate. The Indigenous estate must be accepted as standing for something solid and reliable, a source of value for our people and Australia as a whole, a complex entity that is well run, open for business and a natural partner for investors. It would be the base for strong Indigenous influence in our national life. If we are to have a bold and long-term vision, we also need an order of priority. For my part, and the time that I'll remain as chair of the two organisations, the IBA and the IOC, the IBA promotes Indigenous commercial development. The Indigenous Land Corporation, who owns small parts of the estate, leases parts of it, including a part of the divestment strategy to Indigenous group, manages other parts of it and has a brief to assist Indigenous owners across Australia to gain benefits from their land. This makes the IBA and the ILC significant institutions in helping to define, manage and maximise the use of the Indigenous estate. In other words, to transform the organisations to reach far more structurally, on design and deeper into the Indigenous estate. The ILC as it stands does not enjoy the reputation it, current, it currently has amongst its core constituencies with the Indigenous communities and decision makers in business and governments to maximise its effectiveness. My attention and the board and the executive of both the IBA over the next two to three years will be working on this and they will work in tandem and you will see in the coming um, six months how that is going to unfold. Both agencies need to be more proactive, strategic and commercially astute. They must be capable of taking a significant role in helping to, tra to transform the Indigenous estate. Looking at opportunities within the estate. Look, there are plenty of opportunities. It's just a matter of starting to put down a base plate and, and start working on them. Given the rural and remote nature of the broader Indigenous estate, agribusiness is an obvious starting point. Booming markets are on our doorstep. The Australian dollar is relatively low. We need to invest in rigorous assessments of our estate to determine the highest and best use of the land. And we need, above all, to invest in research and development to position us on the leading edge of innovative technology. The ILC agribusiness portfolio has been active in the northern cattle industry for many years. We already have an ambitious 10-year strategy to increase the scale and scope of this business. And once we, once we certainly get that underway on its um, more defined structural setting, that will start to capture a significant number of Indigenous people, particularly around employment. Tourism is a significant industry for Indigenous Australia. Tourism encompasses both large-scale business, such as the Ayers Rock Resort, owned and operated by the IRC in a small-scale cultural ecotourism business operating at the local level. And, and when you think of the, the rock, I'd, I'd remind people of this. It's the only commercial town in the whole of Australia that we own. And when you compare the, the economic endowment that's been drawn from the country and it will get drawn over the next 100 years, the value on purchase is negligible. Significant opportunities exist for Indigenous people in the conservation and carbon economy, particularly for those who live on country. The ILC has been at the forefront in developing new sources of income for Indigenous landowners, such as carbon farming through controlled savannah burning. And we have partnered with a quite a number of Indigenous organisations and groups around the country to make that happen. However, we will start to ramp this up. The Indigenous estate should be assessed for its potential to generate renewable energy in solar, wind 
and potentially biofuels. Land and water, these things are becoming scarcer in the modern world. Indigenous Australia needs to be a player, and a very critical player, on a structural setting at this critical juncture in human history. And again, I want you to remember that when I raise the point on what I call future-proofing. Unlocking value. All of us collectively need to unlock the value of the Indigenous estate. Let me continue by asking everyone here a question, not for answering, but to give you a lead into where I'm going. When was the last time you looked at yourself as an asset and in what circumstances? In other words, as an individual, what are you bringing to the table to be realised and unlocked? You might answer it by saying that your individual value lies within your talent, your character, your values, your skill set and your experiences gained through personal growth over your lifetime. You have been loaded up with this value from the moment you were born. What you do with it and how you unlock this value to your advantage is the key to your well-being. Unlocking the value of the Indigenous estate is not an insurmountable matter, nor is it to be a lost opportunity going forward. Just like you, the value of the Indigenous estate can be realised, sustained and grown over a longer lead time in a way that makes sense to everyone. Like any business, the value of the Indigenous estate lies in its underlying assets, its composition of land, Indigenous culture and intellectual property, its product offerings, competencies and the development of unique capabilities that value add the core business proposition. I'd like to apply traditional thinking, business thinking to all of these matters. In other words, how do we sweat an asset? That is, is when, an, when a business is able to get the most out of the asset list, value is unlocked. Maybe the asset list may need to be bundled up or indeed unbundled. For example, land exploitation could be separated, unbundled, by listing the agribusiness platform as an example from the actual land properties on which the agribusiness is built on. Shareholders, Indigenous, foreign, domestic investors have an opportunity to generate two income streams or revenue streams. First, from the agribusiness, and second, rental incomes for Indigenous people as the landlord. Applying this outlook across the Indigenous estate provides a way to identify hidden value waiting to be unlocked. We will do this as we seek to accentuate hidden strengths and unique capabilities leading to further opportunities for Indigenous Australians. We will seek to model and deliver our capital allocation plans via a portfolio management structure into the Indigenous estate based on three to five year rolling timeframes which we can use as a working layout model for the next 50 years. This approach will provide us with the ability to review, measure, report and determine our performance for remediation, or remediation growth or movement away from activities relevant to our stated goals of the Indigenous estate's wellbeing. Our intention is to ensure that our connection with Indigenous Australia, government, corporate Australia, domestic and foreign investment partners will provide a sharper focus to our business arrangements. Both the ILC and the IBA have embarked on this approach. Much work is being done and there is ahead of us a great deal more work to be done. Yes, it is extensive, challenging and fraught with questions yet to be asked and answered, but I hasten to add, we are in play. To unveil what is becoming known of the Indigenous estate, we will, at the functional level, seek to accentuate the hidden strengths and unique capabilities of both these organisations or institutions using the following strategic relationships. We will identify and bring into the tent individuals and organisations that can look at a struggling component of our business and apply their lens and assist us to unlock the value of the Indigenous estate we will, as best as we can, apply insight. It is a very uncommon gift. In doing that, we will seek to harness revolutionary and emerging products and research markets that add a game-changing dynamic to our business case, which will feature in our business outlook. Making sure that the IBA and the ILC is driven by insight to give us line of sight beyond the obvious. In keeping an eye on the horizon, just maybe the Indigenous estate 
can become highly competitive at a minimum and at best lead our competitors. We'll also apply what I call the third tranche to this, which is mentorship. It has been often said to me that mentoring is as old as creation. I don't know about that, but what I believe, however, is that mentoring provides anchorage so that you can build a solid foundation and a strong sense of business heritage upon which to build success. As the IOC and the RBA reach deeper into the estate, we will seek to employ mentoring so that a roadmap can be developed to show the bigger picture, reveal where we are today, provide options on decisions and directions, identify our risks, mitigate those risks, and to equip ourselves to manage the road ahead. Mentoring will open doors and be connectors into commercial opportunities. It will unlock value in both these institutions, individuals and business settings within the estate. The Australian challenge. The agenda I've been describing goes beyond the two agencies I currently chair. To grasp the future, we need a greater collective vision and one that wider corporate Australia wants to buy in or be involved in. The Indigenous estate must have a strong identity that is recognised within Australia and beyond, where investors and governments have to take notice. We need a greater coming together of our intellectual, strategic and innovative minds. Nor should we discount the aspirations of individuals. Individual effort has been a great driver of human progress. Indigenous Australians should also embrace the future and not let it happen to us. In other words, just take control of it. Operating within a co coherent commercial framework, I believe, will reap social, cultural and environmental rewards. That means setting aside some of our politics and our prioritisation of narrow vested interests above a more national Indigenous interest. We need a stronger and more united vision and to grow our Indigenous estate. At this gathering, we're rightly celebrating our land rights pioneers and the 40th anniversary of land rights. The legacies of those who've gone before us can be celebrated most effectively by making most of the land that they helped to give back. I acknowledge their right to not collaborate with the agenda I've been describing. That is your right. But I believe we are stronger when we are together and that we can build a powerful new future for our people. There needs to be a wide-ranging discussion about how we position the estate to create wealth and well-being for future generations. And that discussion needs to be focused on what is the consignment that we want to forward. We must use this time together to question our thinking, to debate our future, and agree on a way forward based on shared values. Our strategic plan of the Indigenous state must specify goals, it must have strategic objectives and action, and it must be accountable via the final performance measures by which our institutions and our management and our partners and beneficiaries will gauge success. Our performance will be measured in terms of sustainable outputs and measured on volume market share, cash flow, cash flow projections and applications, and utilisation. It will turn its mind more keenly to a profit-based approach. And there's a very good reason for that. And it will have a much, much keener eye on return of investment on its outlays, which will lead to dividends, as I believe, to intersect our clients' economic, social, cultural, and environmental wellbeing and our clients are the indigenous population of the country. And that this effort, if we get it right, will increment market value of our assets classes. Now, I mentioned during the, the talk about future proofing. I, for the last probably eight months, I've been reading about what, what is the most pressing need for governments and industries in this country. And and they've now switched from uh, a call sign from jobs of the future to now future proofing. Over the next 15 years, there is a growing belief within the uh, 
the government and uh, the, the academia that have focused on this and also industry, that through innovative technology, 40% of Australia's current industries will no longer be there. They will become something else because of innovative technology. Now, what does that really mean? Well, it means 5 million Australians will be transforming and moving into new sets of industries based on this new innovative technology. And they will be competing with the new set of generation that are five-year-old and be 22 and one going forward. Now, that's a big exclamation mark. And why is it, a, why is it an exclamation mark? What does this mean? What are the causal impacts on Indigenous Australia's wellbeing, particularly around employment? How are they going to be built into that? And in closing, everything I've outlined today, I believe our people deserve nothing less. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. One of the best footballers to come out of Catherine as well, for those who don't know that. Uh, I think Eddie made the uh, South Australian team of the century, if I'm not wrong. So, multi-skilled. Multi Just a couple of quick announcements before Maya Tilly introduces the next uh, speaker. Alan Tudge, the Minister for Human Services, will be speaking at 6.30pm in the Garmin Knowledge Centre. Uh, he'll be talking about the health, healthy welfare card, so anyone who's interested in those issues that were raised by Noel this morning, uh, that'll be worthwhile seeing. There's a corporate dinner at 7pm and a message for those corporate groups. Uh, you'll need to send a delegate to meet with Denise about 5pm at the Gama Cafe. Uh, that's for group people with groups of 10. So send a delegate and Denise has got the tickets. Okay. Uh, at 8.30pm, there'll be some Canadian First Nations representatives speaking in the Knowledge Centre as well. And at 9.15pm, out the front of the Knowledge Centre, there's a special ceremony in memory of uh, some of the senior Yungal leaders, particularly female leaders, who have sadly lost over the last few last year. So uh, that's 9.15, a fireside chat out the front of the Knowledge Centre. Mayor Tilly. The next speaker is the Minister for Indigenous Affairs. He was first elected in 2003 as the Senator for the Northern Territory and has been a minister since 2013. He is a friend to many Yolngu people and he is a friend to the Yoti Indi Foundation. Please welcome Nigel Scullion. Thank you. More than five decades ago, on these lands, Yonal people carefully inscribed and designed two petitions on bark. They were from the voices that had not been allowed to resonate loudly enough in the halls of Parliament House in Canberra, and they were partly in Yulamatha, a language that I venture to say probably had not been heard there before. Imagine for a moment what it must have been like for Mr Unipingu Mr Wangamara and Mr Marika as they considered the wording and the design of the petitions, full of hope that someone would recognise their prior claim to land, despairing of all they may lose. Frustrated by the fact that people were not just hearing their message that connection to land is lasting, it's alive and cannot be disrespected. They could only hope that a Minister of the Australian Government would one day stand on land at Yirrkala recognise it as ancestral land and utter words of respect and recognition. Today I honour a tradition that we have established between us and thank you for inviting me to speak with you on your land. I humbly pay my respects to the Gumatch people, the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet. I pay my respects to your elders, past and present, who protected and cared for this land for tens of thousands of years and who cared for community. I want to especially acknowledge Galaroy Unipingu, Bapaji, leader of Gumach, and my good friend for the invitation to be here today. I acknowledge your leadership of your people 
and I thank you for your wise counsel over many years. I look forward to continuing to work with you and Gumach on the years to come. I want to also acknowledge the work of the Yoffa Yindi Foundation led by Denise in preparation for this festival. Before I get into my speech, I'd like to acknowledge the absolute horrors that occurred within the Dondale Correctional Facility. I, like everyone who saw the footage this week, was shocked and appalled at the mistreatment uh, of uh, the children at the detention centre. Every child, in fact, every person in our justice system must be treated with humanity and respect at all times. There can never be any excuse for authorities entrusted with the welfare of children held in custody, meeting out brutality on these same children. We have, must have zero tolerance for these practices. I'm pleased that the Prime Minister uh, has acted immediately to establish a Royal Commission. This needs to be an open and transparent and forensic inquiry that signs a bright light on what occurred and why the atrocities were concealed for so long. It's important that the failures at the Dondale Youth Detention Centre are, are identified as well as the causes of these failures to provide lessons to all correctional institutions in Australia to ensure that they are never repeated. And we must all take appropriate responsibility for what's in occurred, including myself. Now, I'm sorry I wasn't aware of the full circumstances that were exposed this week. Clearly, I must be better informed about such matters particularly when the vast majority of youths held in detention in the Northern Territory are Indigenous. I commit to better monitoring of the actions of all state and territory governments. I've already written to my counterparts in each government offering my support and seeking their advice about how we may do this. I'm sorry that I accepted advice indicating the Northern Territory uh, Minister was responding to the concerns that were previously raised. Just very quickly, there's been some commentary in the media in recent days from people criticising me for not watching the Four Corners program live with a suggestion I only did so because the Prime Minister rang me. This is utter nonsense. I had a long-standing engagement of a very important and private matter um, uh, that I honoured. I watched the program, as many Australians did, with horror and outrage when I returned home. Now to why we're here at Gulkala this weekend. The theme of this festival is the land is our backbone and it's a very apt sentiment. It says in the original Bark petition, and I quote, the land in question has been hunting and food gathering land for the Yirrkala tribes for time immemorial. The story of thousands of years encapsulated in those two Bark petitions wasn't enough to stop the bauxite mine, but it led eventually to recognition in white man's law and to the creation of the Land Rights Act, one of the strongest pieces of legislation to protect land of the Aboriginal people probably in the world. We are now navigating a transition from a system geared towards the recognition of rights in land and waters to a system that supports Indigenous landholders to use these rights to develop their own economic and cultural aspirations. The challenge is still before us. We're not there yet. The challenge is one of many of you, including Galleroy, would have considered 40 years ago as part of the formation of the Justice Woodward Report. Who are the traditional owners? What roles and responsibilities will traditional owners have? How can we translate the recognition of land rights into better outcomes for our first Australians? These questions that now, 40 years on, remain a challenge in front of us. But before I discuss these important issues and how we can wake up land rights once and for all, I want to take this opportunity here at Gama to say it's a privilege to get another opportunity to be Minister for Indigenous Affairs. It's a privilege I don't take lightly and I uh, intend to hit the ground running. Our first Australians deserve nothing less than a fully committed minister. As I have often said, this portfolio, working with our first Australians across the country, uh, is the only por portfolio I want, and I've been delighted to be afforded that privilege. Two years ago, in a Gama speech, I quoted Jawa, Jawa Yunupingu, who said in an AB in uh, interview, it's action we want to see from these people, from politicians. Not just talk, 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 but action. After talking, bang. That's what we want to see from politicians. I want to take this opportunity to recount what I've heard in my discussion with our first people to outline actions for our second term. The work program of my first term was influenced by and constantly evolved because of the discussions I've had in 200 community visits uh, in over 150 communities. Progress 
and priority in my portfolio should not be judged or determined by bureaucrats or academics in the major centres based primarily in the southeast corner of this country. This is something that we need to hear from people in community, something we need to listen to whether that community is in Redfern, in Yalata or Yirrkala. And I want to reflect on what Gulleroy recounted recently as part of his essay in The Monthly. With my family, I built at Gunyara into a place that we hoped all unal places might be, back when hope powered the homeland movement. Men and women go to work and sweat for their wages. Children go to school. Old people are safer and happier, and we are making our way. It is these priorities I've heard across this country time and time again. They are the priorities held as much by non-Indigenous people as our first Australians. And they were the priorities that we all recognised needed to be acted on after many years, across both sides of politics, where the change that Indigenous Australians should have expected had not been delivered on. Now, this change has not always been popular, and I acknowledge that we haven't always got everything right. Far from it. But things have started to change. Through the funding reforms we've introduced as part of the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, we now know for the first time where Indigenous Affairs funding is going, something I was never able to get an answer on when I was in opposition. We now have a much better understanding of what's working and what's not working. And importantly, around 55% of the funds are now going to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations. Despite some of the myths that have been peddled by those with alternative agendas, there's actually been a significant increase in the number of organisations being funded. And speaking of myths, I was just speaking to Marsha Langdon earlier today uh, and uh, she was asking me, she had some concerns about the Ranger program uh, and a leak from Crikey had indicated, you know, everybody was going to be terminated in five years and the program's over. Well, you know, if it looks gammon, it probably is, and I'm happy to uh, tell you that that is complete nonsense. It is really important um, that we acknowledge that the number of Indigenous organisations, not only in the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, but across every layer of government, are not enough. They're certainly not high enough. And I'll be pushing to make sure that good, robust organisations are getting the job done and if they don't have the capacity, we'll be working with organisations to ensure that they have the capacity uh, and they have the funds to be better run by Indigenous people or have a high number of Indigenous people working for them. My commitment to you today is that we will work to better understand what each community wants and needs and support those activities to reach their goals. Increasingly, we'll work with communities to move beyond the old transactional way of doing business. I want relationships that are based on understanding your goals, the future that Aboriginal Islander people want to build, working to tailor local solutions that are owned by the people that are involved. This is what I've previously spoken about, and I have spoken to the Dilak here in North East Arnhem Land about, about respecting the Dilak as the cultural authority of the region and as my principal source of advice for government and for government when it comes to policies and programs. Now, whilst I've locked in this relationship and we have a very clear understanding of our roles and responsibilities in North East Arnhem Land, we're a long way from that across Australia. So to lock in this relationship in a wider scope will be the challenge for this term and one that I'm looking forward to taking on. Across the country, we're working with Indigenous communities as well as part of our Empowered Communities Initiative by funding the backbone organisations to move this new way of thinking and work to the next level. I acknowledge the work today of many of you here in this important initiative and particularly like to acknowledge uh, the work of Noel. I was uh, uh, more and much better informed and have a higher level of, uh, of confidence listening uh, to his explanation um, around the hook and other issues that I think are very difficult issues. And thank you for that, Noel. Looking ahead, I know that the key to closing the gap lies not just about me investing money or the other governments investing money and rolling out programs. If we want to value add all these programs, we need to ensure that we are working in a partnership with a shared pur purpose. Now, my responsibility is to redouble my efforts to work with my ministerial colleagues across the Australian government and the states and the territories. I control about 7% of the budget 
that impact on Indigenous people. 7%. So over the next three years, my mantra will be every minister, every department, every government. And my colleagues will be hearing it over and over. Not only from me, but I hope from all of you. Getting better outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people must be front and centre for every minister, every department, every state. And none of us need to rest until every minister and every department understands that at the front of their thinking, the first thing that they think of is how can I assist the First Peoples? Is this a contract I can give out? If I can't, how do I raise their capacity to ensure that the next time round that can occur? This national effort will build on the solid foundation established over the last three years. Now, I came to the job with a very clear agenda getting children to school, adults to work, and making communities safe. Now, some said, oh, that's a bit simplistic, it's just a three-line slogan, but focusing on these basics has given us a fundamental work framework for future direction. So, for example, by getting kids to school, our commitment to them is not just about getting their foot in the door of the classroom, but the best possible education, to see them attain at the same level and have every opportunity post-school that their white friends have whether through further training, education or employment. In the same way, we've put in place policies to support Indigenous businesses. Our procurement policy has seen Commonwealth contracts with Indigenous-owned companies increase from around six million uh, in uh, basically June of 2015. So it's a bit over our 12-month anniversary and we've gone from six million to 200 million and growing. So why is this so important? Because Indigenous businesses, own businesses, are a hundred times more likely to employ another Indigenous Australian than other mainstream businesses. And the other reason it's very important is because it shows that it can be done. It shows that it can be done. If we simply make a decision that we will buy products and services from Indigenous businesses, and that's across government, it just shows in one year the amount that we can actually achieve. And I'll be speaking um, more tonight to the corporate dinner, but my commitment to you is to continue to grow this. More companies owned by Indigenous people will benefit from government contracts. Other governments need to do this. Other companies need to do this. And anyone that the Commonwealth will be doing business with in the future, if they want to keep doing business with in the future, will need to do this. And it's that joint effort from both governments and business is needed to derive delivery of change. That's why during the election campaign we committed to 90 million over three years to support more enterprises, more new and emerging businesses, more opportunities for entrepreneurs. And each day as a result of our programs, about 60 people are starting in a real job. Now we only fund, or well, we're starting to more fund companies on outcomes. So not just the churn of somebody coming for two weeks, the employer getting paid for them to start, not making any effort to ensure that they're culturally, they're culturally competent and being in that churn. We pay people on the, in the main uh, when Indigenous people are employed for six months. So you don't get an initiative payment until the period of time that we know somebody needs to be in that workplace to feel comfortable, for the workplace to be more culturally competent and to ensure that they are driven uh, by ensuring that that outcome is the same as ours. And we know once you're there for six months, there's a very, very high chance of you remaining in the workforce. So too, our new community development program is starting to build positive change. I know from speaking to leaders in communities that this is the change that they want. They've said very clearly to me, we want our people to be active, to be changed, trained and to contribute to the community and its future to help them into long-term jobs. It's a message we've heard loud and clear and I'm committed to overcoming the, the barriers in the halls of Parliament House and other houses of power across the country to deliver what the community wants. A return to many of the positive elements of the old Community Development and Employment Program, especially to a return to the direct relationship between local community organisations and job seekers instead of the ever unavailable Centrelink. If our employment programs are to be successful, we know we need to make a real impact through the support 
we provide to improve education outcomes for our first Australians. At higher education levels, there is virtually no employment gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. And it's inspirational to see the rapid increases in the numbers of Indigenous students pursuing higher education. 70% increase in the decade between 2004 and 2014, and that's a ge geometric rate of progression. Education believes begins early. Quality early education helps a seamless transition to school. This is why we have the ambitious target of having 95% of all Indigenous four-year-olds enrolled in early childhood education. And I don't need to say it again, but you know that while I'm your minister, school attendance will always be firmly on the national agenda. I won't tolerate passive racism where entrenched low expectations of Indigenous children relegate them to getting a second class education or because of the temporary relationship with the education, no education at all. Changing this starts with making sure kids attend school every day, working with parents and families to make sure this happens, having the best teachers. You can see here in this urinal region, there's about 130 dedicated school attendance officers are supporting kids and families. Every one of them deserves recognition for their creativity, their tenacity and commitment to improving the lives of children in their communities. We must also make changes to broaden the education system to recognise Indigenous Australians at the heart of the nation to make this a key area of studies for all. And perhaps before I just go on and make some particular announcements, I should, I think, go to my motive for this. We have, over time in our history, made some attempts, some very successful, some not so successful, at what we call reconciliation. To, recognize, to reconcile the differences between our first peoples and those who came after them. Some of these have been great, some not so. I often think, I often think about, this is about understanding more about the other person. How do I put myself in someone else's shoes? Well, many of you would be around my age, or some of you around my age, and I'm sure it affected plenty of people much younger than me. But what we were taught at school was uh, this notion that this bloke, Captain Cook, arrived on a beach. They were there with their finery, in their finery, very civilised, you know, wearing multitudes of felt and all sorts of uniforms. And there was the poor savage on the beach. You know, a bit of kangaroo skin, he's got a fire, he's got a stick, no civilisation. We brought civilisation to Australia. I mean, that was the notion I learnt in school. Frankly, I don't think that's changed too much. Um, but doesn't it, it it's, my dad used to say, look, a lie is two things. You can pervert the facts, and that's a lie, or you can redact or not say a whole bunch of stuff, and that's equally in that category. And so the painting of our history uh, to our children uh, has done just that. We, we haven't told the real story because perhaps I could forgive Captain Cook because he may not have understood what he was seeing and was flitted off in a boat somewhere. But the truth that we know, and we are sitting in the centre of culture and spirituality in this place, the truth is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia enjoyed the most complex civilisation, the most complex civilisation. They had the most challenging you know, so many nations, hundreds and hundreds of nations. And they had foreign affairs policies that were highly complex. The refreshing, the refreshment of those foreign affairs policies were complex and worked out over tens of thousands of years. Their domestic policies about intermarriage, about rules, about families, about relationships, about how you would resolve those matters were eminently as complex as the Peruvian Empire and the Egyptian Empire, which we learnt lots about at school. And I think the most, one of the most important things is a lot of people talk about country uh, and a lot of people talk about the way that country, in a real sense, is protected. We're all concerned. There wasn't one square inch of this country pre-settlement that wasn't managed particularly it was managed by fire, but it was also managed by a complex series of legislation uh, and regulation. 
and it was refreshed. And when resources moved between nations, they made sure that on both sides of that nation they had the same approach. So what an interesting history and yet nobody knows anything about it. And this is so important in terms of reconciliation because it's very hard for us to understand how Aboriginal people are today until we really understand what we took away. So that I know that our Indigenous culture is at the heart of our nation. It's my strong belief that Aboriginal and Islander culture and history must be explored, explained, learnt about and delighted in in our schools. So Indigenous language and history will be at the heart of our curriculum, has to be at the heart of our curriculum, if we are to educate future Australians to be truly respectful and value our nation's heritage. I commit today to work with the Minister for Education, Simon Birmingham, state and territory governments and communities and schools to ensure the foundation to Year 10 curriculum is designed to enable all students to engage in reconciliation, in respect and recognition of the world's oldest continuing living cultures. It shouldn't only be those of us fortunate enough to attend events like Gama who have the chance to engage in culture and language. And I look forward to the focus on Indigenous education being rolled out in schools across the country as a matter of priority. As I said earlier, this year's Gama theme, Land is Our Backbone, rings so true to all of us. Over the years, I've seen people connect with their land, their country, their culture. I've heard stories from their dream time. I've had song lines shared with me that are so much a part of the culture and the land that is the backbone of those stories. At Gama last year, Gumach traditional owners and I signed a memorandum of understanding to negotiate a township leaf for Gunyara, held by a community organisation, not by a government statutory office holder. And Galloway has said, I really want the benefits of this, but there's an element of this that actually takes away my control for our land and we're not doing that. So let's sit down and work on that basis. How is it that we can get the benefits of the lease, but we don't lose the control in a cultural sense, which we are unable to give away? So we sat down and I listened to innovators who came up with a wonderful, innovative solution to the challenge and great progress has been made to what will be the first township lease to be held by a traditional owner corporation. This new time of town township lease will unlock opportunities for its owners, for its community and for this region and will be an example of traditional owners taking up the opportunities of their land and using it to create the community they want for their kids and future generations. This isn't a standalone example. Government is working with other communities and land councils to support traditional owners with similar aspirations and I look forward to working with other communities wishing to adopt this particular model in the future. There are just so many good stories to tell from this part of the world that show Gumach traditional owners leading the way to develop businesses, particularly in remote and very remote Aboriginal land. Not far from where we sit now, I'm not sure if you've gone across there, you'll see the accommodation facilities for Gumach's mine training centre. Here the Gumach employees will be receiving on-the-job training in a range of fields. When you go there, every single part of that has been built by Gumach. Have a look at the bricks. Have a look at the timber. Have a look at the completely finished furniture. Every single thing was built here uh, by Gumach people. There are many of their enterprises that focus on sustainable jobs and income into the future. We've seen firsthand in Galawinki, the Yonal building houses from their people from the timber trusses and the concrete blocks that were made right here in East Arnhem Land by 100% by Yonal people. And it's great to see them decide, make an absolute decision that our bottom line isn't about money. Our bottom line is about employment and engagement. And that's how people participate, through employment and engagement, not only through profit. We back for much in these projects because we know that every dollar invested by government delivers much more dollar value to Indigenous communities. It's about traditional owners and communities stepping up, speaking up, governments and representative bodies like land councils listening and asking where and how we can assist. Government and land councils are the supporting actors, traditional owners and communities should be the star of this story. 
I will be providing $5 million in funding for Gumach uh, to build additional employment housing in Gunyangara, and it will all be built, and as far as we can, by materials that are made here, and it will all be built by Gumach employees from this region. So their efforts in training and employment are significant. Now, we recognise the importance of ensuring that organisations like Gumach have the economic enhancement infrastructure to capitalise on the potential of their land, their ingenuity and their effort combined. We've also worked with land councils to improve processes for the delegation of certain land council functions to subcommittees or sustainable local and regional organisations. I want to see these delegations used to support the aspirations of traditional owners and reduce unnecessary bureaucratic process. I want to work with the land councils to continue to implement what was always intended under the Land Rights Act, and it's about implementing uh, what was intended by Justice Woodward and what leaders like Galleroy told him 40 years ago. And he said, it is important that Aboriginal communities should have as much autonomy as possible in running their own affairs. They should receive the necessary funds to cover administration and other normal recurrent expenditures. Aboriginal people should be free to follow their own traditional methods of decision making. It's the implementation of this agenda, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's agenda, that I've committed to making funds available for in the Northern Territory for traditional owners to pursue their own decision making, whether it be through some community entity township leasing or any of the delegations available under the Land Rights Act or Native Title. Our government is already supporting Baniella traditional owners, which for those who are not familiar is almost due south of us here, um, to build their capacity and work towards taking a decision-making power for leasing and land management for their community. And I hope the lessons for Baniella uh, uh, that are learnt can be shared with other groups that are interested in going down this path. Uh, traditional owners shouldn't have to jump through the same hoops as mining companies or big business to invest in and utilise their own land assets. Now, I know I share this view with the land councils. Uh, I want to work with both the traditional owners and the land councils about how we can better support traditional owner developments to ensure the process for local people to use their own land is as simple as possible. This will certainly assist in waking up land rights. This is how we can find a better place, a proper place for traditional owners in the system that is currently focused around governments and land councils. We must also remember that the struggle for land rights continues for many, despite the bipartisan universal support for recognition of traditional owners of land. Now, I've committed an additional million dollars in funding over the next four years to support the work of the Land Commissioner. Uh, this money will contribute to the resolution of the remaining land claims in the Northern Territory, and I know that the land councils in the Northern Territory are always working apace for the resolution of the remaining claims. We will also continue to provide $110 million a year over the next four years to help finalise all current native title claims within this decade. The vision for land rights is big, it will take work, it also can't be done by one person or one organisation, it requires a genuine partnership between traditional owners, representative bodies and governments. I'll continue to meet with you in your communities on your terms to hear your feedback about how we are all going and to guide our work in this program. One strong example of this is the Redfin Statement, released during the campaign, the election campaign. It's a good read uh, and it's been delivered, uh, developed by some great people. I share the aspiration that's outlined in this document. Um, it really speaks to me. I think we must not only connect in dialogue but also in action. I'll be speaking to the architects of some of the uh, Redfern State from hopefully this weekend, but we will be meeting uh, and we will be talking. Uh, there's not a world of difference necessarily between our uh, aspirations and we might always agree on how to get there, I think I've used the line. Like all of you here in the room, certainly leaders of your communities, those making a real difference on the ground, we have common ambitions. There are times when strategies are outlined to address some of these issues they might not be the ones I propose, but that will never stop me from sitting down, consulting, meeting and giving an opportunity to talk to me about how we might change the government's approach of the day. In this spirit, I will be inviting the signatories of the Redfin Statement to what's broadly called a workshop.
to constructively work through some of these issues uh, we've raised. We will continue along this important journey to constitutional recognition and the Parliament looks forward to receiving the recommendations of the Referendum Council soon. In closing, let me again acknowledge that we're here on the most important of lands, the country where land rights journey began. Lands that have triggered the most important shifts in how governments work for our First People. More than 50 years on, let this be the start of a new chapter of working together to ensure the people get to use the values of their land in their way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for being here today and for sharing your map of what's to come. We're not going to stop for long, just a couple of minutes to get organised. Uh, for those that are interested in the Land and Sea Forum, I'm told they actually got it underway but over at the Knowledge Centre and the Canadian groups are over there, so if anyone has pencilled in that uh, stream, now's the time to go to that. The, there'll be, I'm going to just take 60 to 90, maybe two minutes to get organised and then we're going to start the economic Forum, which will be with Jawa and Klaus, the Yotha Yindi Foundation and Miwatch Employment and Participation. Testing one, two.
Justin. Okay, we'll, we'll keep moving so that we get through. All right, this is another of the hitting the road sessions. Uh, the, all these presenters are all integrally involved in the economy of North East Arnhem Land. The Othi Indy Foundation takes the lead.